What do you think of the new Twitter, Bob? Like the new UI? Oh, God. Nope. Oh, well, first of all, I don't go to Twitter that often. Like the actual twitter.com slash Bob and Kevin show. I don't right. go to that. Um, I use, uh, what do I use? I use TweetDeck. So the TweetDeck UI always stays the same. But um, I have had the unfortunate uh, experience of visiting new Twitter, and uh, I don't like it. I can't stand it whatsoever. So I use. What's the, your pet peeves about it? <clears throat> I just think like the spacing's all wrong. The font sizes are all strange. Um, yeah, you know, f- finding like the logout button is not intuitive. Um, logout. You log out. Wow, that's weird. Well, yeah, uh, I switch. <laughs> well, I don't use TweetDeck, and we'll we'll figure out what TweetDeck is in a second for the uninitiated. However, for me, um, I log out of say my handle and log into the Bob and Shevin or Bob and Shevin. The Bob, Bob and Shevin <laughs> Co. Hey, have you ever wondered how you can get in touch with us at the Bob and Kevin Show? Well, first. You can try us via email at comments at bobandkevinshow.com. Or are you more into social? If so, you can find us on Twitter at Bob and Kevin Show. Or on Instagram as Bob N. Kevin Show. That's Bob, the letter N, Kevin Show. And if you're still on Facebook, you can even find us at facebook.com slash Bob and Kevin Show. And for the serious business fans, you can even find us on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash company slash the dash Bob dash Kevin dash show. How's that for a handle? Let's connect. I'm inventing shows now. <laughs> Bob and Kevin's show. And, you know, once I'm in there, you know, I, I log in, then I log back out and, and so on and so forth. So explain to the lay user what TweetDeck is. Bob. Oh, see, you got to get. Well, all right. I know why you don't got TweetDeck. Um, so TweetDeck is possibly the most magnificent nightmare of ADD social anxiety compacted into as many columns as you choose to display at any given moment. So it's browser-based. You do sign in with your Twitter credentials. But if your Twitter credential, credentials, well, you can actually add all the accounts that you have and you can create columns for all those accounts and you can create a column for mentions and a column for these hashtags and you could just fill your screen and scroll left and right as far as you want with all this columns of content. For a lot of people, that can be very overwhelming. Um, I don't know, for me, I'm starting to learn more and more for me. I must have a lot of noise in my head that needs to be quieted by that kind of chaos because TweetDeck doesn't bother me. So long story short, it allows you to see and track multiple accounts for Twitter all in one dashboard, and you can tweet from more than one handle. It's like Command Center, right? For yeah, Twitter. it's awesome. So I, I click the Create New Tweet button, and it's it basically it doesn't say this in a WYSIWYG kind of thing, but I get this mental picture of it, and it's like, which account would you like to tweet from? Or when you hit the retweet button, you know, which account would you like to RT this from? So it, it's just, yeah. So um, I collect Twitter accounts now, I guess, like I used to collect domain names. So uh, TweetDeck is really awesome. Another cool thing about TweetDeck, um, and maybe this isn't necessarily the most commonly known feature of it, but if you want to share an account with another TweetDeck user through the TweetDeck UI, you can basically just add a person another person's Twitter handle to be able to manage that account. Ooh, I did not know you could do that. Yeah. I like that. That is a, I don't necessarily know if that's a widely publicized feature, but for teaming, it's great. So, so team, team-based team Twitters. So we know how Facebook is like one account, one identity, period, end statement. So you log in as Bob, I log in, well, I don't log in as Kevin anymore, but you log in as Bob, and then if you have a, a Bob and Kevin Show page, which I think we do, um, you are an admin of that page, but you're still logged in as Bob. Twitter yes. is a different story. You, you can have 10 accounts, you can have 10 email addresses and whatnot. So what I'm getting at here is Twitter does, and they kind of talk out both sides of their mouth. So they don't want you to have a bunch of accounts that support other accounts, kind of like, you know, Russian troll style. Right. But they also don't kind of actively prohibit it. And then they also offer TweetDeck, which kind of like makes it easy to be a troll on Twitter, doesn't it? 
Yeah, I, that might be an unintended consequence because I know that even myself, like if something gets posted from the show account, it's very easy for me to like it from my personal account and retweet it from my personal account and vice versa. And if I have multiple accounts that I manage, I could, in theory, propagate that tweet through across many accounts that might serve very different audiences and right. help gain extended reach. Right. Inorganically. So I don't like the new Twitter browser-based stuff. I, I do kind of like the tweet deck, the way you sell it. But you know what else I don't like, Bob? <laughs> I have, in the last probably five or six years, have gotten probably a lifetime's worth of free credit monitoring. Why do you ask? Well, you haven't asked, but you're going to ask. Why, Kevin? Beca well, it's because this goes back to a t uh, conversation we had earlier this week. So, yeah, you approached me and said... I said, hey, did you know you can go get some cash from the Equifax settlement? And you're like... And I said, hell no, I did not. How do I do it? And you sent me a link. Yep. And then I asked if you did the cash or the free credit monitoring, and you explained. <laughs> uh, well, I, I went ahead and took the cash option um, because I've got a crap ton of credit monitoring. My crap, my personal details have been this disclosed so many times over. I, I've actively had to thwart credit card, people signing up for credit cards in my name, et cetera, et cetera. So I decided, you know what, I'll, I'll at least get a little money for my effort, right? Well, you actually made it sound like, I mean, because the standard amount that they were advertising doing the air quotes thing was 125 bones, right? Yep. And you can go up to $20,000 in your claim if you can- 20,000? Two with four zeros after it, yes. So mm, no, that's five zeros, but nope. <clears throat> Twenty thousand would be four zeros. You're right. That's I'm okay. Wrong. That's okay. <laughs> I uh, math good. <laughs> I can has math hard. Um, English too. So yeah. So if you could prove that that was that's a you know you've spent that sort of money on that, then yes, you could try to recover up to that much. So I claim some hours of effort because I spent a lot of time on the phone with banks that I didn't even, I don't even have a relationship with, like Chase Bank, for instance. And this really grinds my gears because uh, like a year and a half ago, I'm like, hey, Chase Bank, somebody's trying to open up a card and it's in my name. And guess what? I don't want your card. They're like, okay, sir, um, we'll cancel that for you. I'm like, great. I don't ever want to do business with your bank. Can you just go ahead and not accept me as a customer ever in the future again to prevent this sort of thing? And they look, or they didn't look at me. We're on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> they probably cocked their head and said, why would you want to do something silly like that, sir? Well, I, I don't want somebody to just pretend they're me and sign up for Chase Bank. I'm just, you know, sorry. I just don't want your stuff. And they're like, sorry, sir, we can't do that. We can't put a block in the system that says, Kevin, you can't be a customer. I'm like, well, I, I kind of get where you probably don't have that option in your software. Um, but that's basically what I said to do. I never want to be one of your customers. Thanks. Please mark me as such. And they're like, well, we can't do that. I'm like, okay, well. Very convenient that they can't do that. Right. But so that that was obviously your credit card that you did not request. Correct. That is, and it happened at least a few times. So and do you freeze your credit now? In I do. Whatever app you use. I do. I don't use an app to do it. They um they make it difficult. I think still in in 2019 um, to freeze your credit. I mean, you go online and fill out a form, and it, it takes about 10 or 15 minutes. And then I had to unfreeze it for a mortgage, and I had to refreeze it. And it's kind of cool because you can say, all right, from this day to this day, it's unfroze. So it's almost like whack-a-mole. All right, if you're going to screw Kevin, do it during this block of time. <sighs> oh, boy. So, so you applied because you've had such interesting, challenging, uh, I've been pwned type situations. So you were able to apply for over the 125. Correct. And, you know, the, the other thing that gets me, I saw headlines, either, I think it was yesterday, Capital One, one of the largest breaches. Yes. And I'm That's like, one of my companies. Yep. I'm like, we are getting so desensitized, perhaps, as Joe, Joe Consumer out there is getting, or Jane Consumer, either one, they're getting desensitized to, oh, yeah, that's normal, you know, whatever. But... You know, individually, if you're Capital One or Equifax, well, here's your credit monitoring. All right, let's kind of wash our hands from this. We did our part. We did the we did the get you your token settlement, and okay, on on to business. But as an aggregate, man, I've had this happen a dozen times in the last few years. 
I only need so many credit monitoring things, right? Yeah, but the other thing that kind of pissed me off about this whole situation, so you told me this, and I was like, damn, buck 25 just for filling it out? Yes, I was in the breach, so all right. And so I, I literally filled mine out, texted my wife. Well, no, I actually emailed her. Um, emailed her and said, I know this is going to sound scammy and spammy coming, but this is actually your husband, and you should go <laughs> fill this out because you were in the breach as well. I said, don't be freaked out by the six digits of your social security number. Kind of freaked me out a little bit in the form. Um, but I said, it's going to get you 125 bucks. And she was like, are you sure? And I was like, yes, Kevin told me this Uh is what's going to (laughs) happen. Stuff that goes bad. It's my fault. Great. (laughs) But literally as soon as I sent that email to her and she verified that it was like actually me via text and all this kind of stuff, I started seeing the headlines like, Hey, dumbass, guess what? You're not going to get $125. And I was like, mother f- f- flipper, I'll wait till after the 15 minute mark to drop the F bombs. I probably already did anyway. But yeah, so apparently that was best case scenario. But if a bunch of people make that claim, it turns out maybe the better value was to take the free credit monitoring. <laughs> well, explain, because I, I guess I don't understand. Um, why that's the better value or why we're not going to get 125 bucks? Yes, both. Well, the reason for not the 125 bucks is because apparently there was a fixed number on the settlement. Mm. So let's say that it was $50 million. I don't remember the exact. Oh, actually. Wait, are you telling me this is first come, first serve? Uh, it's not first come, first serve. It is total number of applicants divided by total money available. Oh, you're saying so, it dilutes. Yeah, so the FTC, which is now warning victims of the 2017 Equifax data breach that the much-hyped $125 per person settlement payout is really just a mirage. Um, The company screwed over so many people that there's not enough cash to go around. The full amount of the settlement, of course, is probably in a different article. Gosh darn it. But basically, let's say it was $50 million. If only 50 people claimed it, then apparently they would have gotten a million dollars each. But if 50 million people claim it, they're only getting a dollar. So they're Mm. saying that at the end, net, net, um, the credit monitoring is probably a higher dollar value than the check they're going to cut. Well, I will say that there might be a second lawsuit that basically says, you mother truckers have misled us, because I got no impression that that was the case on the site at all. Nobody did. Nobody said up to $125. It said $125, period, end statement. (laughs) The FTC is saying that there's nowhere near the $125 that they could have gotten if there hadn't have been such an enormous number of claims filed. So apparently they're already seeing claims being filed and know that that 125 is not feasible. Well, I guess time will tell. Uh, you know what I did also find that that form was like, wait a second, here's what could happen. The 700 million or the, well, that's the settlement amount. The, all the data that got breached, you're telling me that the people who have this breach data can go and fill out these forms a bunch of times too, right? Because they have all yeah. the information, <laughs> right? Oh, geez. Yeah, so it says because the total amount available for the the payments is, oh, it's only $31 million. So it's not even 50, oh, it's gosh. 31. Oh, so well. Yeah, easy come, easy go. Obviously, it was too good to be true. Well, that takes me to my next point. At some point, you, we have to dis or we have to incentivize people being responsible with this sort of data. And I don't think just slapping them on the wrist. And I'm looking at you too, Facebook. Hey, ooh, five billion dollar <laughs> fine. Yeah, that's a lot of coin for Bob and Kevin. But for Facebook, that's a shoulder shrug. That is an absolute travesty. You got to make it hurt. You know, that won't make anyone hurt. They're going to do it again. Yeah. There's no, there's no, there's no penalty. So it's like we're in the throes of, you know, coming up on the, the, you know, the brief 20 second gap between election cycles has just ended abruptly. And we are in the 2020 election cycle full swing. If we haven't been for months already, we definitely are now. 
and you know a lot of they're talking about like climate change and fossil fuels and and how that's like the biggest you know the biggest existential threat to our, not only our government but the global existence and it's like you know you you hear about the fossil fuel industry and oil and not to bring up data as the new oil but these companies these data companies are basically like the fossil fuel companies of, yeah they're you know, they're standard oil they're new. of 2019 yeah. totally and, and they're being careless with their activities and they're damaging the data world that we live in all right um hmm speaking of damaging the data world that we live in yeah i shared a, i shared a podcast with you a couple days ago um it's a it's a relatively new podcast and it's about the the big tech giants. It's a it's a recode Vox Media project. Um, of course, I'm drawing a blank on the name of it. Uh, it's, I believe uh, something giant, right? Uh, Land of the yeah. Giants. Land of the Giants. And this season is all about Amazon. Yes. And uh, one of the the episode, the second episode of the series, is all about Amazon Alexa. There was some interesting tidbits. I, I made it through the first two episodes. And they're they're thirty minutes long, and uh, the beauty is is that we can talk about another podcast because well we do it all the time with with Mr. Rogan, and uh, part of what we do here at the Bob and Kevin Show is we provide value, and that even means talking about another podcast. So yeah, I agree. Well, I, you got, I thought it was we good. get our information from all over the web, and podcast is one of those delivery vehicles. So, but Absolutely. yeah, I, I thought. When I listened to that episode, I was on the elliptical and I was like, oh God, this is this is right up Kevin's gear grinding alley here because <laughs> it talks the interesting thing is I guess you can find the, it talks about uh patents that Amazon has regarding their Alexa technology. And apparently those are publicly available because they're filed through the patent office, which is a government entity, right? Yep. Um yeah, patents do go through government. And a lot of people would say, including me, we, uh, we don't need them anymore. Uh, not in the software world, at least, because really all it is is just setting up uh, people in power to have more legal authority to stay in power. No, but I do like the way that this um, content author, or I guess we'll call him an investigative reporter at this point, uses those patents to kind of like reading tea leaves looking at the patents that, that Amazon has established regarding voice tech to kind of look at it as a roadmap of where our in-home voice assistants will be living in the future, basically. Well, I think we all know we're on a path for it's not good, but we... Actually, they even he, was, he even talks about it in the pod. You know, I know this is wrong, but I still have one. You know, <laughs> it's an Alexa, you know, so... Um, well, it's that same thing we talk about with um, the all the ad retargeting and all the data being bought, swapped, sold. You know, people get all freaked out about it and they say that, you know, they hate their privacy being invaded and then Spotify plays their favorite song without them even having to ask for it and everybody thinks that, oh, everything's all right with the world. And the same thing with this author about the the Alexa or the Amazon device. So you know, instant dance party. You made mention of the the presidential election cycle and you watched the debates last night. Were any topics related to any things that we kind of harp upon? No, the, the, you know, there's so many hot button social issues that data and privacy. It's so funny because they had all those congressional hearings, um, these giant tech, you know, monolithic beasts are, you know, constantly dealing with legislation and fines and, kind of helping us define what this new data landscape looks like, but it didn't come up at all. And it'd be, I mean, it'll be interesting because uh, Andrew Yang is on the debate tonight, which is going on right now. Um, it'll be interesting if he brings up some of this stuff because he is uh, very much a tech entrepreneur and that's kind of so, his claim to fame. So a lot of times in sports you say, would you take the reigning champ or the field, you know, in a, in a bet here? So, Politics aside, no disclosure, you don't have to, of any sort of politics, but the 2020 election, are you taking the man who's there, the current reigning champ, or the field? I watched the first half of the field debate last night, and uh, you know what? I'll go ahead and throw some 
so throw some political cards on the table. Uh, the Democrats have this uncanny ability of self-destruction. And from what I saw last night of the 10 of the 20 that were debating last night, they're all not even close to on the same page. So they're going to divide their own party again, and it's probably going to end up going to the champ. I'll have to uh, echo that, too. So not saying who I'm going to vote for um, or who you're going to vote for, right? Oh, I'm not voting for the champ. That's a problem to me. Well, I I (laughs) didn't go ahead and put that out there. I didn't vote for uh, any of the uh, main contenders last time. But, um, yeah, I just don't see Trump losing because the man could literally drag a dead body down Fifth Avenue right now and nobody would care. Well, that's almost as cool. Well, half the population wouldn't care. <laughs> uh, so I just, you know, if the economy stays hot, I just don't. I, I see a lot of people going, well, at least I'm making good money, but the guy uh, up there is kind of deranged, but whatever, shoulder shrug. I'm trying to figure out what happened today because the Fed lowered interest rates for mm-hmm. the first time in mm-hmm. a decade. Is that right? 2008. Yep. So over a decade. Yep. Over a decade, and the markets responded negatively. Because I think like, the Dow was down one percent today, three hundred or over one percent, three hundred some points. It's the old wait a second. What do you know that we don't know? Type thing. Yeah, yeah. The market's weird to watch anyway, and that's a whole. I would love to do an episode on the technology of um, markets and trading. It, I'd have to do a lot of homework first, but that's something that's very fascinating to me. So uh, what do you think? I think we should uh, start the show. You are listening to The Bob and Kevin Show with Bob Beatty Bar and Kevin Gisheski. Each week we cover relevant tech and social issues related to technology. Our website is bobandkevin.show. And our episodes can be found virtually on any podcast network. Be sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Just search for Bob and Kevin Show. Hey, Bob, what are we doing today? Kevin, 21 minutes in, we're going to dedicate the rest of the show to talking about a community called Quayside or Keyside or Kayside. I don't know how it's pronounced, but it is a an intentional community that is being uh, developed, proposed by uh, Sidewalk, right? Is that the name of the company? Uh, Sidewalk it's Labs. A, Sidewalk Labs, which is one of the Alphabet properties, which Alphabet is the parent company of Google. So we're going to talk about what that project is, the technological implications, and maybe even discuss some of the issues that they're having where they probably didn't expect that they were going to have them. So I'm Bob from the Bob and Kevin show, and that guy over there is... I'm Kevin. Not... uh, Keshin, what did you say in the uh, cold? Bob and <laughs> Keshin, or <laughs> Bob and Ke- Kevish, Kevish. Oh, no, I don't know, something like that. So yeah. So, what do you know about Quayside or the project? Well, it started with an article from this really hipster friend I have, uh, you actually, and uh, I read through it. And uh, I've been to Toronto. Um, have you been to Toronto, Mr. I have Bidwell? not been to Toronto. Toronto's a great place. The cost I heard of li- it's amazing. The cost of living is ridiculous, though. And a lot of your uh, home and garden TV shows, like your Love It or List It and, you know, that kind of stuff, that's all filmed up there in, uh, in the Toronto area, Mississauga area. Really? Uh, yes. Hey. Yay. <laughs> uh, in 2001, I very nearly moved to Toronto permanently. Oh. Uh, and uh, my, I, I, it turned out I had to get my own work visa, and I couldn't uh, afford it at the time. The thoughts and opinions of Bob and Kevin of the Bob and Kevin show are exclusively the thoughts of Bob and Kevin and not the thoughts of their employers. Past, present, and probably not future. Um, so anyway, uh, what do we know about Quasi? So from my understanding, Alphabet, through their subsidiary Sidewalk Labs, is looking to set up a neighborhood on land they own, I think, question mark? They did purchase it. And they're setting up a utopia of sorts. Would you agree that's kind of the the thing? Yeah, so 
they just recently, I think within the last 30-ish days, maybe 45 now, they released a 1,524-page master plan. I learned today that that uh, report weighs 18 pounds, by the way. Wow. And it's in three volumes. And so that master plan outlines uh, an an entirety of a project that's actually quite large. And for some reason, my screen just went blank. That's not good. So, uh, interesting. It's just my notes, so that's a bummer. All right. (laughs) I didn't know know what that meant. I didn't know if... uh, the FBI was descending on your location based on the last episode we just dropped. So, no, but the Googles might be uh, listening in. Might be listening in and trying to shut down my my research here. Uh, what I was going to continue on. So, there, this company, we'll just call it Google, uh, <laughs> essentially, because people know what Google is. Um, so, a sibling company to Google is trying to set up a utopian neighborhood. And it's on the shores of Lake Ontario. And the idea is they're going to try to be the most innovative city in the world. So it's going to be smart sidewalks. Like in the wintertime, it, it burns off all of the – warms up and burns off all the snow so people can uh, do pedestrian traffic. They're going to have, you know, any sort of – smart utility and technology. They're going to have uh, a certain percent of affordable. I'm using air quotes with my fingers. I don't know what ah. affordable housing is versus un- what is un- what is the opposite of affordable housing? Is it unaffordable that, housing? I think they actually call it conventional or I rich, don't know. rich people housing, um, <laughs> expensive ass housing <laughs> um, and yada, yada, yada. So sounds great. Doesn't it, Bob? What could go wrong? Um, Well, there's a couple different aspects to it. So there's the innovative urban planning aspect of it, which, you know, is pretty interesting that Google has got their hands in, you know, not just the technology aspect of it, but the actual, you know, like urban planning, you know, some of the innovations that aren't technologically related is they want to build most of the buildings. Uh, There's several, there's mentions of several 30 story mixed use buildings um, that are made of mostly timber. And the rest of the part that's not timber is prefabricated, of course, by a uh, company that Google also owns. <laughs> so of course. It's this weird, like, you know, the technology and the urban planning aside, it's almost like this weird glimpse into this ubiquitous type future that... That's just unexplainable. So I'm I'm reading on Wikipedia. So this is a Wikipedia um, verified here. Um, There's a town or Toronto city councilor um, looking, you know, it said, hey, I would like to know more about your agreement. And he wanted to make the the actual agreement. So apparently there's there's the proposal, but then there's also the contract. That contract is not public. And he made a failed motion to get the contract itself public. And one question came up for the CEO of Sidewalk Labs, and his name appears to be Dan Doctoroff. Yes. He's, um, he stated that while data sharing isn't in Sidewalk Labs' ethos, he can't say definitively whether uh, what will happen, that is, with the, uh, the information collected in Wayside. So it's possible that they just don't want to commit to saying, you know what, we won't just make a bunch of money off this. Because we're kind of, they're kind of building the Truman Show, right, in reality? Yeah, because the data collection is going to be pretty much 24-7, 365, and the Wi-Fi is going to be wall-to-wall 5G. And they're even making, like, mounts, like universal mounts that third-party vendors can create, you know, other data monitoring services to put place on these poles, for lack of a better... <laughs> and, and this goes back to what you're saying before the uh, the show intro, which data is the new oil. And I think people are starting to get hip to the idea that your behavior, when digitized, is valuable. Not only is it valuable, people are stealing it from you as we speak. Well, and I think that there's oddly going to be an open source component about the data. So... They'll have sensors throughout the neighborhood that would collect data about energy consumption, building use, traffic patterns, which could be feet, 
bicycle or automobile. Um, and there's going to be, they're going to build a software platform around it that would analyze and manage the raw information would be anonymized and held in a third party data trust. We've talked about third party trust before, I believe. Yeah. I, it sounds just like lip service to me. Right? right. And personal parts, personal parts would never be sold to third party vendors. Bull crap. So, right. <laughs> uh, Bob, do you know who James Demore is? That name. Oh yeah, we you mentioned him on the last episode too, right? He's the Google the memo sex organs guy. guy. Oh no, the no, Google he, memo guy. He's the yeah. Google. Not the, no, that's you're thinking of Marshall McLuhan. Damn it, James Demore is the infamous Google memo guy. And I he's, thought we promised we weren't going to bring him up. Well, we can bring him up, but we won't go where <laughs> we can't go. Um, but my question for you is: is he worked for Google, and when when you listen to the Joe Rogan with with him on there, which I, I highly recommend, he made mention of the fact that Google's very into demographics and diversity. Or they're trying to overcome diversity issues. Clearly, they have work to do. Inter that's what they think internally. But since this is a Alphabet slash Google property, do we think that? Not only are we setting up innovative things, are they also controlling the population mix on purpose? Well, that's actually a large component of the urban planning, is it? and that's the intentionality of the community. Uh, one of the one of the many tenets or you know pillars that they're going for here is diversity and equity is actually listed as one of their their tenants as well. So, the, I think with the approach to the subsidized or the affordable housing, not subsidized, the affordable housing um, component, they're trying to create greater access within the Toronto community um, and bring, you know, a very diverse cross section down to the lakefront. Um, so yeah, that, that intentionality is an interesting component that, that forced diversity um, uh, Let's call it intentionality. Let's not call it forced diversity. I think uh, I think that might be harsh. As a tangent to um, this com or community, Quayside, Bob, have you ever heard of another one? And it was called Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. No. If I were Damn, to tell you, you did better homework than me. <laughs> well, if I were to tell you, put that into an acronym, and it would be called Epcot. Oh, yeah, actually they they in some of the articles that I've read they've drawn some parallels between Disney and Quayside. I absolutely went there and this is what I was kind of quizzing you pre-show I'm like, "Hmm, are you going to go the direction that I immediately went to?" So, shocker or maybe not so shocker, Walt Disney himself attempted to plan and create this exact same kind of scenario, this utopian society based on the most current and innovative technology, and it was called the Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. And when Walt died in 1966, I think everyone at Walt Disney went, ah, oh, thank God, we don't have to do that. <laughs> in fact, let's just turn it into a theme park. And that's what they did, and that um, they actually rebranded it uh, a few years ago where it's no longer an acronym, it is now just capital E, lowercase, the rest of the letters. And it's meant to be the World's Fair, uh, like a, a perpetual World's Fair. But right. uh, Walt had this grand vision of creating utopian society. And I thought, wow, somebody's going to do this again. But again, I've got thoughts on utopia. But what do you think about the Epcot parallel? Did, did you know much about that Walt Disney story? No, I didn't know about the Walt Disney story, but they had mentioned that one of the innovations, I'm putting innovations in air quotes because of this connection, um, with Quayside, they want to put a lot of the last mile services is what they call them underground. So garbage collection would be handled by bots underground, um, deliveries would be underground deliveries. So to take that heavy traffic, heavy vehicle traffic off the main thoroughfares and underground. And apparently Disney has underground garbage removal. So... I think that that's, you know, and they did mention that in one of the articles. So there's obviously, there's obviously a deep connection with that uh, Epcot versus what's going on here with City Labs. So I don't know that or Sidewalk Labs has used the word utopia for themselves, but I think that's kind of like the, 
we don't say it, but we let you think it and you say it yourself kind of thing. Hey, we're going to create a utopian society. You're going to want to live here. It's going to be the best. It's going to be the greatest. Well, but they do use the word intentional and they use ubiquitous a lot. So, well, ubiquitous just means everywhere, you know, omnipresence. It's, it's right. Well, that, so, they relate that to the technology aspect of it, but the intentional by, you know, creating different, like diverse types of living situations to try to bring, you know, a diverse tenancy, I guess. I don't know, clientele. So I would <laughs> say their underlying mission is to create a utopia. But if you just go to Wikipedia, which I did a lot today, you say, hey, Wikipedia. It's kind of like, hey, Google, hey, hey, Siri, or whatever. What is utopia? And I'll just read the definition. A utopia is an imagined community or society that possesses highly desirable or nearly perfect qualities for its citizens. Sound familiar? Uh, the opposite of a utopia is a dystopia. There's a lot of movies for dystopia out there. Yes. And then one could say that utopia is a perfect place that has been designed so there are no problems. How much does that definition line up with what Alphabet slash Sidewalk Labs is trying to do, Bob? Well, and I'm sure it lines up with what uh, Walt Disney was trying to do, too. Um, yeah, I think they're definitely, I think they're testing, internally testing whether they can do this or not. Well, let, let me stop now, the you there. Big thing is, the big thing is, though, is they're, I think they're hitting hurdles with the residents of Toronto. Well, and, and, and let's play a little little back and forth here. Do you think they'll be successful or is it possible for them to pull this off? I, they have unlimited funds. Let's just say they have unlimited right, right, funds. Right. I, they're only, I think their obstacle right now is to be able to get the green light to do it. Um, one right. of the articles that I read um, likened the, the grassroots movement in Toronto to similar to what happened in Queens to keep Amazon from doing their headquarters there. All right. Let's, let's take a mental leap and say, you know what? They've got approval. Now, here you, you can do it. Go. So what's the chances of them pulling this off, Bob, on a scale of zero to 100 percent? Their chances of pulling this off would be? I don't know. They're going to control the messaging. So even if it's not a success, they're going to control the messaging that it's a very successful venture. Then it becomes a Black Mirror episode. So <laughs> according to Wikipedia, and I, I, I couldn't put it together as eloquently as this, think about a utopia. A utopia is that perfect place. But if I throw in the words for who, it's perfect for who. If it's a pedophile utopia, it's not so good for the children. It, you know, and so if you look through all the different kind of utopias that could exist, there could be a socialist utopia, a capitalist utopia, a democratic one, a republican utopia, an anarchist one, an ecological, a feminist, a patriarchal, an egalitarian, left-wing, right-wing, reformist, Nazi, free love. Those could all be utopias. So utopias, Yeah, I think that's probably why they shy away from using that word. Right. Because they're it, smart. Exactly. It's a utopia, but for who? Because um, the article goes on to say, you know, yes, uh, even if it's a utopia for Bob and Kevin, eventually Bob and Kevin are going to have a disagreement. We call it politics, right? Well, I believe this and you believe that. Are we no longer in a utopia? And that's only two of its population. Do we all right. have to be in this cult? But I, I, I think you're you might be getting hung up by putting that label on this because <laughs> Maybe. just because just because it's intentional, uh, there's I mean they're looking at positive aspects like uh, net zero or net sub zero carbon footprint. Like that's the kind of stuff that they're, you know. Their utopia, they're not really talking about the the uh, the standard of living or the quality of life that the residents will have. It's just talking about eliminating barriers like with the snow melting and heated pavement and the the this whatever the umbrellas they call them something the the building raincoats. You know, that's just to maximize outdoor space in a climate that doesn't necessarily have maximized outdoor space. Like Toronto is adapted to their climate and a lot of their stuff, their current infrastructure uh, allows for indoor living, indoor existence during the cold winter months where this kind of stuff that the alphabet's trying to develop is uh, trying to bring people back outside. So Bob, you live in an apartment, you have a landlord, it's owned by a private entity. 
You also live in the city of Boulder, which is uh, a public entity, a city. Which is utopia, by the way. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would have to agree that's the closest natural utopia. Um, so what if Boulder, Colorado were owned by Google, which they have a campus in <laughs> Boulder? I'm sure it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> would that give you any pause or would you finally think that, hmm, Maybe I have to become part of Google culture. I mean, they own, maybe they can selectively decide whether or not I can have this apartment, whether I can live in Boulder or not. You know, at what point, how much say do they have who can live in this manufactured society? Well, I mean, if you can't, if you can't afford it, then somebody's telling you, and I don't think government should have a monopoly on communities because I wouldn't say that the government's got a, they're not batting 1,000, you know? <laughs> well, I don't think they've got by a couple definition of, a government couple can, have a, can have a monopoly because a government is a public entity and no one single person owns it, et cetera, et cetera. I guess you could say that about a corporation. Right. I mean, the, the definition of monopoly is basically everything but the government <laughs> because the government does have a monopoly on a lot of our, like, socialist services. So... But, you know, they do try to privatize some of those as well. So I, I just I don't think the government's got the deadlock answer. So a private organization having an ownership interest um, doesn't really bother me because Google Google's not going to totally Alphabet's not totally going to own the community. I think that they're they're providing the seed money to start things up, but it's not a for profit venture for sidewalk labs how much you want to bet to use any of these cool air quotes innovative things you got to have a gmail account or a, a whatever to participate so that they can track you uh probably but i mean what's the big deal <laughs> well because are you gonna have a facebook neighborhood move in next oh uh, you know two blocks over probably gotta, gotta be on I, facebook I, to live here sorry well, one of the things that they talk about in all the documentation in the master plan is that that, that um, Sidewalk Labs is hoping that this will be a blueprint for other communities and other organizations to be able to replicate the things that worked and the things, you know, and then, uh, you know, innovate on the things that didn't. So, I mean, this is just all really well-crafted prose at this point. We don't have anything that's technically a, a full-blown proof of concept. And I would, we may never I would see counter it. that. I think there is. And it's not the Disney one. We already have in the country of China pre built cities that there are zero inhabitants of right now. So, what China does is they go ahead and they build an entire, what I would consider, or they would consider a perfectly designed city from scratch. And then they let the people move in. Have you ever seen any of these? I have not. So every now and then you'll catch it on like ABC News or, you know, it's just some sort of special where it's like, here's an entire city, but nobody lives there, you know, and it's one of those sorts of things because they pre-build these cities and then they let people move in. So I think they're, I don't know the efficacy of these. I really don't. But if I were to venture a guess, I would think that a pre-built city is not going to be what you think it's going to be. You think? Well, now remember, this is just a pre-built part of a city. It's not a self-contained entity. True. And, and that's kind of where I was going because I would say the city of Boulder has done, or actually any good, nice city has done better by growing with time rather than starting as an adult city, if you will. Yeah, but they all have growing pains. I mean, and I don't think, obviously, Quayside's not going to be a full-blown adult city. Now, one of the things that I did read, though, that I do think is incredibly positive is they're going to extend uh, the rail system. They're going to put light rail to Quayside, and it will be ready before people move in. That aspect will be ready. So, so but that's that's actually smart because so, they're going to encourage people to work in the city and still live there. So if you're – now, this technically isn't in Toronto. It's in, like, Toronto Lakeside, which is – or yes. something. You know, it's like, you know, it's urban crawl. Uh, when you go to Toronto, and I do recommend you go there – it's urban sprawl all around the north side of Lake Ontario. And it's, yeah, it's really it's just quite a big city, huge. big lakeside city. Yeah. So um, do you think 
Have you that, been to Chicago? Same thing. <laughs> oh yeah, Chicago itself is actually very small, right? It, it's all the the suburbs that right. make the Chicago land area ginormous. Um, so what I was thinking though, do you think somehow, some way, Google's going to be able to determine who lives in their city? Because here in America, we have or neighborhood, I guess, can't call it city. Here in America, we have fair housing and whatnot, and you know. There, there's a lot of laws. I don't know the Canadian laws. Did, did Alphabet choose Canada because of favorable you know, conditions for engineering their population? Well, if you think of the rules, the laws that we have for uh, fair housing and stuff like that here in the U.S., and then think about how it is in California, which is like way more highly legislated than it is in the rest of the U.S., then multiply that times a factor of X and you have Canada. <laughs> so as far as like, you know, fairness and equity, like Canada is leaps and bounds ahead of us in that regard. So they maybe did pick it because it's favorable to, without much effort, have a community that's built around the maximum potential for diversity and equity. I'm sure that that factored into it. And I think Toronto was actually shopping this around too, though. Like I think they were they were welcoming... The government aspect of it was welcoming something like this. The people of Toronto, not as much as you would think. So I think Google's trying to be more diverse, but I think we have the potential here that they engineer a certain education level, a certain economic skill level, et cetera, et cetera, where they actually create non-diverse area of the world by trying to make it a diverse area of the world. Do well, you think? I think they're going to fill, I think they're going to fill the traditional housing, like the non, the non low income housing. I think they'll fill that relatively quickly because the cost of living in Toronto is already high and it's probably, you know, uh, an early adopter tech based kind of area. I think that's part of the reason that was attractive to, um, sidewalk labs as well, but you know, they're not going to be able to, they have to fill the other aspects of it and they can't, they can't fill it outside the plan. So if the plan was to have, you know, diverse housing availability, they can't wipe that aspect of it out because they'd be in breach of contract of the plan. So, all right. Alphabet owns Google, which technically isn't Google. That is, isn't technically running this, but you and I know, the, Alphabet's uh, a shadow company that's just Google. Totally. Um, but so we know the history of Google products. And Google Fiber is another one of those things. They they go into certain markets and then they're like, yep, we're going to throw this money at this. Oh, well, let's write that off in tax and we're going to leave. See ya, bye. So how, you yeah, know, when I, you I think they have an out planned for this as well. I don't think they'd pull their fiber. That would suck, but. No, but I they can stop supporting it or, but they can be like, you know what, this isn't working. We went into this bread-ed, bushy-tailed, you know, here's our utopian dream. Turns out it ain't going to work. You keep putting utopia on it. I don't think that that's... <laughs> I think they're just trying to build the city 2.0 or the neighborhood 2.0. I don't think they're... It's This is totally a technological and social experiment for them. I'll give you that. And they could pull out of it. But I think that they're going to Truman show it enough initially that the press will all be positive until until the whistleblowers come until black mirror episode on this very thing <laughs> airs on netflix right yeah I i'm surprised there isn't one already but i mean i mean it's got all the makings without a doubt all right let me ask you all right bob you've been offered a substantial sum of money you're going to move to toronto and this is one of the neighborhoods in your um you know, affordability range, are you game to move in? Oh, I would totally try it. Okay. I would totally not. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you totally not? I I don't like surveillance state, or if I if I choose surveillance, like I have Alexa things here. So uh, I, yeah, hold on. Let, yeah, but yeah, but let's rephrase it. You don't you don't like in uh on the surface advertised surveillance state because let's be honest you live in one it's just not advertised as one right now i would like to have the 
blissful ignorance to think there that I'm go. not being there you monitored go. at every moment. And you may say, well, at least they tell you, but that doesn't make it right either. You know, it doesn't make it right, but at least you're going in with your eyes wide open and you could make some choices. I mean, I would love to live in an area that had, you know, transit from the moment that I arrived, had most of the last mile services below ground, had 5G internet everywhere in the community. I would love that. Says the guy in Boulder, Colorado. Well, (laughs) I mean. You're not far from that exact scenario, are you? No. I mean, I don't know about the, I mean, I guess. Uh, they have light rail in Denver. It doesn't yeah, go up to Denver, Boulder. Yeah, in Denver, it doesn't go out to Boulder, which is right. unfortunate. I thought it did. Um, and Xfinity is pretty much everywhere around here. So I could be connected pretty much, you know, when I'm out riding my bike, whatnot. But Well, because new things set precedents, I don't like the precedent that this is going to set. Hey, we've got this great place. You could do all these great things, but the price of admission is your data, is your privacy. Once again, though, that's just, it's that's no different than where we live right now. They're just advertising it. I really don't have that much of an issue with them. You know, I, I have probably more of an issue of them trying to do all this bullshitty cover-up language that, you know, it'll never be sold to a third party and there's an independent, you know, data trust and like blah, blah, blah. Spare me your bullshit. I know that you're going to record everything that I do. It might be anonymous, great, but it probably won't be, but you're still going to record it anyway. And that shit happens to us all day, every day. Already. Agre- agreed. And so there's a lot broken, but I also don't <laughs> think we should be over about it, let alone condone it. But what if this is, what if, what if we've been incorrect about what importance privacy means to us for since the beginning because people have been monitored since the beginning. Anyway, the government's always been watching. (laughs) Um, Which (laughs) totally reminded me of the book 1984. The main character oftentimes went back to his room. And do you know, do you remember what is in everybody's bedroom or apartment? Is it a mirror or something? It's it's a screen. Screen. Yeah. Yeah. You watch the morning propaganda and guess what? They watch you back. They want to make sure you're not fidgeting, not doing something else. And I get that we sort of do that implied now, but guess who's who, guess who's not going to embrace an entire neighborhood built upon this concept, this guy. I'm pointing You're not going to embrace it just because you're angry that that they're just being upfront about it now. Like instead of lying, they're just telling you. Okay, so if I steal but don't tell you now if I steal, but tell you that I'm stealing, I'm better is what you're telling me. No, because that's an established law. Like the others, this is all like, this is all the wild, wild West. Well, this is comes back to the Bob and Kevin show theme or one of our tenants, which is technology is head and shoulders above legislation and laws. Yeah. It's way far in front of it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I don't have to like it, Bob. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> no, no. So you don't have to like it, but I, you know, you just kept labeling Utopia on it, and I don't think that's what they're they're well, advertising. I, I can, oh, they're not advertising, but I could read you that definition again, and you tell me if that's congruent or not, and I would say it is. That's exactly what they're going for. It may be a so a Utopia can be like I said, it could be a fascist Utopia, it can be a socialist one, it can be a christian one it can be a you know whatever one but they call it they're calling it a smart city startup oh that's what sidewalk labs is and i would call a smart city utopia the most innovative district in the entire world that's what they're calling it the most innovative district you know when walt disney when's the last time you've been to epcot we took the kids when Lillian was too young. She was like four, and it was okay. a nightmare. Yeah, Sorry, Epcot's Lillian. for older people. And then, I well, we did Disney and Epcot. So I was last there in 2018, so not too long ago, and about a year and a half ago, and it feels really, really, really dated. So when it somebody does, comes, because I think he built it in the 50s, right? No, 1982 is when it opened. Oh, but they were using his original concepts, though, right? Yeah, he died in 66. Right. So, uh, and then Walt Disney World Florida didn't open until 1970. So the California one was open first. Anyway, I digress. 
So it goes there and you're like, holy crap, I get the futuristic vibe if this were the 80s or whatnot. But that's the problem with saying we're going to be the most innovative city. You're going to be the most innovative city now timestamp it in 2019, that back in 2019. Now, they're always going to have to upgrade. So, hey, remember that one time we thought it'd be a good idea to have, you know, those mounts so those third parties could have. Yeah, the, now everyone wears computer sensors and on their side of their temple. Now we don't need those anymore. Guess what? In 10 years, those look dated, those little old mounts. So I don't care how. Yeah, but they're literally just poles. They could just take them down. <laughs> yeah, but that's the same thing you could have said about yesterday's technology. Well, all you got to do is, but they don't, and things fall into disrepair, and then the building itself looks like it's from 1982. Well, this building looks like it's from 2019, because in the future, all the buildings are levitating, or, you know, I'm just, you know, picking ridiculous things, but no matter, I think it's a fallacy to think that we will always be the most cutting-edge city ever, anywhere. Bullshit, because there's, guess what, Facebook's going to try to one-up you. Well, modularity gonna... is one of their tenants as well. So, sure. I mean, I think they're building with future in mind. All right. I take you to the software industry, Bob. You ever, are you familiar with it? <laughs> and when's the last yes. time you tried to do every, anything modular? Well, every day. And how has that made your life? Well, it makes it a little bit better, but it, it, does everything just work? It sure as hell does not. You still, that's why we still have jobs, Bob, because yes. we, we think we've got it all figured out. We're the, we've got the new pattern down pat and guess what? The round peg does not go into the square hole today. Never Damn will. it. So all I'm saying is I think this is a bit of Pollyanna uh, to think that Google or people with unlimited funds can just create out of nowhere, out of thin air, the best city ever because while that sounds great, I also know that it's alphabet. They've got an evil planet. This is a Black Mirror episode, Bob. You well, know it. Let me ask you a question then. What would you prefer our tech giants do with their unlimited budgets? Move to fucking Mars. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. an easy one. Elon's trying. Um Honestly, I'm, I, I know the older I get, the more get off my lawn I sound like, but humanity needs a downgrade, not more constant, ever present upgrade, upgrade, upgrade. Holy crap. My ki kids, do you even know anyone's phone number? You probably know five people's phone number. 30 years ago, you knew 300 people's phone number. You know, I, called, I called my parents today by me from memory. That was good. Oh, that's good. And yes. Okay, great. You can learn. You have more phone numbers. You're, you're be somehow better. No, I just think the it's like space and time are linked right you know the faster you go blah 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 there's there's effects there on um on space itself well the more technology we have there's a space and or uh, technology and humanity i think are linked so the more technology oh, we sure. have the farther away i think we get away from humanity and at some point we gotta say you know what a door is a door it doesn't need to be a smart door a window is a window. It doesn't need to be a smart window. Okay, well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to sidewalktoronto.ca, and oh, I want geez. you to read the propaganda that's there. Oh, wait, wait. You can't say propaganda. You're for this, Bob. You got to say the marketing. I understand, but I want you to read it because I want one thing that I was really looking for in my research was a bunch of juicy stuff about the technology because we're a technology show, right? Right. And I tried really hard to find stuff about the technology aspect of it. And this is much more about not necessarily a technological upgrade for a neighborhood, but a an attempt to use their unlimited resources to create an environment that encourages use of the space in the most efficient way possible. That's Wait, really what this boils down to. I can't tell if you're making my utopian point or not, because it sounds like you're making my point. No, they're, I think they're making opportunity. They're not promising any kind of environment other than something that's been designed and engineered to provide the opportunity for maximum usage. Well, that's where I go back to the utopian. A utopian society is... Depends on pick your goal, and this is our aim, and we're going to create a society under that goal and vision. That's your utopia that we're right. trying to create. 
but they don't have a bunch of stuff about the person's experience. They're talking about their their negative hey, emissions. Let They're me help you, Bob. I'll define the utopia. We are going to create a data utopia where we can mine the shit out of all the unsuspecting people that we put into the incubator. Right, that is they, the utopia. They already have that. The utopia isn't for the residents. It's for <laughs> the sidewalk labs. Well, all right. Well, then that's... But I'd still... There's a lot of really like... There's a lot of uh, progressive environmental, not just like environmental as far as carbon and things like that, but creating an environment that's conducive to community. It's almost like Facebook in real life. All right. So <laughs> I'm not saying that creating a better world, a better community isn't good. I just don't think it should be run by a fucking for-profit data s- screw you company. But who's going to run it if they don't? The, the people. I mean, I hate to sound all but like... But where do the resources come from? Where, the where people, does the, where tax does the, revenue. Where does the capital influx come from? We can't, well, we can't build a new community now with our tax infrastructure. We can't. I'll give when, you the government's builder, fucked when up. A builder but... comes in, when a builder comes in and says, I want to build a 300,000 square foot shopping center that has residential on level two and the opportunity for businesses, you know, food shops, design agencies and stuff to occupy the first floor. Do we have any problem with that? Because that's all private investors. No. Yes and no. Um, downtown Denver or somewhere, probably not. But in the middle of nowhere, Indiana, where I live, yeah, actually, I do have a problem with that because same reason I don't like big box stores in the middle of nowhere because they kill off the, the local economy people. Right, but the only way to get more tax revenue into a municipality is to give people a reason to come to the municipality to spend money. Yeah, totally. Totally get that. <laughs> but so so a chicken has to lay an egg. But the, there's a there's a bit of inversion of control here. You can come in and build your building, but the government's still in charge. What I'm getting from this is Google's bought a bunch of land and they're creating a zone, a district, a neighborhood, if you will that they are not just controlling a building they're controlling the entire your entire life hey this is where this is where we think you should eat this is where we think you should shop this is where you think you should congregate this is where we think you should worship this is where we think you whatever and it's it feels like a closed society to me veiled with this utopian sort of technological oh but you'll be you'll be the most hip hipster in the north side of lake ontario you know okay <laughs> you know that's i feel like that's what they're selling I think the government still needs to be in charge because, yes, even though nobody trusts politicians and whatnot, we can get rid of the politicians. We can't get rid of a company but, who owns but a neighborhood. Like, but just like the shopping center, the local government has to green light this proposal, just like a shopping center. Well, if you read the the Quayside Wikipedia article, it sounds like they're... They're, they gave them like four days to decide or review the 1,500-page proposal and look at the contract, and it's not even public. So it just sounds like, you know, forcing this down somebody's throat here, and I just feel like, what's going on here? If, if you're really all about this <laughs> utopia, <laughs> that, that word you're going to hate now, <laughs> if you're really about this, shouldn't you be more transparent? Shouldn't you be more forthcoming? Shouldn't you be, you know... There's an angle here that's not been brought to the surface. Well, the Canadian Civil Civil Liberties Association is actually suing the Canadian government to halt development of this project. Yeah, so maybe they think maybe they're a bunch of wackos like me who think that maybe we don't want this. Maybe maybe there's some limits to what we should do. Yes, we should use the 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 regular old systems we've got and not privatize communities. To the that suit extent. was actually filed back in April. That's very interesting. Why Court orders interesting would nullify the agreement. It, this is probably about the purchase agreement more than anything else. So just out of curiosity, Bob, do you know, uh, let's say I'm going to name off all of the subsidiaries of Google, if I can find it. Okay. Um, of Alphabet. Or I'm sorry, of Alphabet. <laughs> Because 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 we all know that Alphabet's really Google. Um, so Alphabet has Google. It has something called Calico. Do you know what Calico is? Hell's no. 
Uh, it is an American research and development biotech company founded in 2013 by so-and-so and backed by Google with the goal of combating aging and associated diseases. Sounds very noble. Next one they own is DeepMind. Ever heard of DeepMind? Is that their AI division? DeepMind Technologies is a UK company founded in 2010, currently owned by Alphabet. The company is based in London with research centers in Canada. Okay, that doesn't tell me what they do. Uh, the company has created a neural network that learns how to play video games. So Neural network, yeah, so that's their AI. Okay, that's their AI. Crap. TensorFlow. Uh, they got one called GV. It's called Google Ventures. Or it's GV, short for Google Ventures. It's that's the venture- their mergers and acquisitions It's their we need more money or high tax money uh, arm of the company. Uh, Capital G, formerly Google Capital, is a private equity firm. Sounds like more money hiding to me. (laughs) 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 Do I sound jaded? Um, They have a subsidiary just called X. Maybe it's (laughs) so if this were Apple, would this just be called 10? That's always been confusing to me. I'm sure since it's alphabet, it's X. Yes. God. I, you know what grinds my gears? iPhone 10. It's not iPhone 10. It's iPhone X to me. Of course, whatever. I dig it. Okay. X is for, formerly Google X, so it's called X Development, is an American semi-secret. Ooh, what is this? Ooh, that's the government part. Semi-secret research and development facility and organization founded by Google in 2010. And it's Google headquarters are close to the Googleplex in Mountain View, uh, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. I want to work for them. I don't know what they do. Okay. X's mission is to invent and launch moonshot technologies that aim to make the world radically a better place. So better they're for theoretical, who? <laughs> <laughs> they're theoretical physicists. That work yeah. for Google. Nice. They sit around and collect money all day. A moonshot is defined by X as the intersection of a big problem, a radical solution, and breakthrough technology. Oh, sounds so cool. Okay, Google Fiber. Uh, I think we know what that is. Jigsaw. Do you know what Jigsaw is? That's the company that puts it all together? Formerly Google Ideas. Do, do they ever keep their original name is what I want to know. Heck No. Uh, it's a technology incubator created by Google, operated by Alphabet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, New York City, global challenges, blah, 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 counter extremism, online censorship, and cyber attacks. Oh, it's a propaganda company. Sweet. Oh, my gosh. They blah, blah, blah. So basically. What's that one called again? Jigsaw. I'll send Ooh, you. I'll send I want to work for here. them. Um, I'll send you a link later. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, my. Anyone nice. from Siegel, if you're listening, I'm totally kidding. Uh, Google's way too big for me. Yes. Uh, Probably wouldn't r- let me Can you run low. the disclaimer, but like in like 10x speed right <laughs> here? <laughs> the thoughts and opinions of Bobby Kevin of the Bobby Kevin Show are exclusively the thoughts of Bobby Kevin and not the thoughts of their employers. Past, present, and probably not future. Okay, next one is called Makani. M-A-K-N-I-A or N-I-A-N-I. They're going to have to change that. It's not an alphabet. And yeah, one day it'll be formerly Makani, um, is an Alameda based company that develops airborne wind turbines in the U.S. Department, you know, in conjunction with the U.S. Department of Energy. And they say the noise causes cancer. You tell me that. Wait, one. Okay. airborne wind turbines? That, yeah, let me I click think those on are that. Called pro- I think those are called propellers. <laughs> uh, wow, what is that? It looks like an, it's supported without, it's, it's a wind turbine without a tower. Wow, that's kind of wild looking. It hovers? Uh, you'll have to Google it. We're on radio here, so it doesn't. I'll ha- yeah, Google it. <laughs> and then you can see what it looks like. Everyone I'm who's gonna, listening, I'm going to bing it because I'm anti Google right now. Okay, fair enough. Uh, they own <laughs> Sidewalk Labs. They own Verily. Have you ever heard of Verily? Mm-mm. All right, let's find out what the. Oh, formerly, you want to take a guess? <laughs> formerly, very cool things. I have no idea. Formerly, Google Life Sciences. Ooh. Is Alphabet's research organization devoted to the study of life sciences? The organization was formerly a division of Google X. Okay. Ooh. Ooh. Google X is spooky, so that means yeah. Verily is kind of spooky. Waymo. I've heard of Waymo, but I couldn't tell you what it is. Waymo so is their driverless technology group. Oh my gosh, you are so on it. Boom. You are correct. Boom. <laughs> All right, so there's Waymo. Uh, and then Wing, or, and they have one called Loon, but there's no link. Wing okay. sounds like flying. Wing is a subsidiary of Alphabet that drone-based delivery of freight. There you go. Just Flying. what I need. Something that comes to my house as a drone. Can you imagine? You know, so we always see like Amazon testing, you know, this new delivery method and it's a drone. 
in the future, is there going to be swarms of drones? Yes. That is scary. Yes. You want to fly an airplane with a swarm of drones coming out of the Amazon warehouse? No, I don't. Yeah. Do you no want way. to jump out of a plane with a swarm of Amazon drones coming out of the no. warehouse? No. <laughs> oh, wow. Fun fact. What is Alphabet's web address? ABC.com. You were close. Damn well, it. Guess, one more guess. XYZ.com. Oh, my gosh. You're so close. It's ABC.XYZ. Oh. <laughs> How would... Oh, my God. I mean, that's brilliant scary and amazing. I do have a marketing mind, if you didn't know. Yeah. And so if you go there, there's like almost nothing on this page. So. Well, just like Google. ABC.XYZ. That's fucking brilliant. You know, if you're Alphabet and, and you're Sergey and Larry or whatever their names are, you don't need a big deep web page. You really need an explanation on what we do. <laughs> you know? Just trust us. We just yeah. do it. We do. Check us on Wikipedia like Kevin's doing. Did That's you know you that the do. woman behind 23andMe is married to one of those guys? I think she's married to Sergey. Really? Oh, well, let's see what Wikipedia has to say about that. Uh, Sergey Brins. Everybody says, who's your spouse? And Anne- Wajiki. Waj- yep. Wajiki. Yep, 23 and me. Sounds like a Polish name. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Anyway, okay, so we've we've learned a lot about Alphabet, Google, where Kevin thinks on Utopia Society's <laughs> land, um, where Bob lands on that. Obviously, Kevin's not a fan of Quayside, where Bob could potentially move there someday, if like if it gets made. It sounds like it's not going to get made. It, it, you know what it probably is? It's one of these, hey, we've got this great idea. It'll cost so much money. We'll, we'll all make great salaries, and we'll write it off as a loss, and we'll all just not have to pay taxes next year. What do you guys think? Let's do it! <laughs> Yay! Well, it sounds like half their companies are like pie in the sky. It sounds like most of them are moonshot ideas. So. Well, let's see. I'm going to look up Uber real quick because you know, Uber's like, hey, that's a great idea, but they can't make any money. You know what their operating income for 2018 was, Bob? Their income? Operating income for 2018 was? Not a guess. Actually, let's go with net income. Well, for that's what I was thinking. Net income? Yep. Is it positive? Basically, what is their profit last year, Bob? Was it positive? Uh, I'm going to go with a no on that. <laughs> okay. I didn't think they had a positive income. So what do you think their loss was last year? $2 billion. Yeah, wow, man, you're good at this. Minus $1.8 billion. How do you lose $2 billion and stay in business, Bob? Explain this damn, to me. That's a damn good question. What is their... Um, I, they've they got funding, right? They have yeah, private investors. They're, they're, yeah, they they IPO'd lose, even, right? I lose 20 bucks at the blackjack table. I'm sweating, dude. All right? <laughs> How do you lose $2 billion and go to sleep? Uh, little known... Uh, Bob, fact, I played blackjack at a casino one time. I gave myself $50 to play blackjack. I was done playing blackjack in two minutes and 45 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Last time and I, I was never in played Ve- again. Last time I was in Vegas, I had like 100 bucks. And I'm like, this is going to last me three days, right? <laughs> yeah. I didn't even get a free drink because it was gone before she got back. <laughs> That's how bad wah, it was. Wah, wah. <laughs> Uh, all right, Bob. Uh, what what did we forget? Uh, I'm sure we forgot tons, but I I think uh, I think I, I'm debated out. I, I'm I'm tired. And all right, so what did we solve today? Uh, we didn't solve shit. Not a as damn per thing. usual. But I think we we talked through a couple uh, talked through a couple topics and hopefully shared some some thought provoking statements and thoughts and. That's all we can hope for. You know what? We're like the Uber of podcasts. We do a lot. We provide a lot of value, but we have nothing to show for it. <laughs> so, you know, there we and, go. And we lost $1.8 billion last year. So. As long as it's not losing 1.8 billion listeners, I'll be okay with that. You know, if we lost, if if our wives even knew the money that we have into this project, we wouldn't be allowed to do it anymore. Right. And Microphones. It's, and, and it's nowhere oh. near $1.8 Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I've got some new show con or uh, show 
stuff, but we're kind of out of time. We'll, we'll maybe save it for next episode. I thought you just told me you got new headphones, too. Where are your new headphones? Oh, I did. The, um, my favorite surveillance state retailer is sending those to me <laughs> oh. <laughs> soon. <laughs> oh, they're on order. I yes. thought you had them in your possession. Um, digitally, yes. I can yes. see my order online. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Just one more uh, point of business, Bob, I think, and that is... We're going to bring the Google X Quayside 